Once a helicopter goes down, that becomes, in military terminology, a baited ambush. It's the bait. This was going to be a different game. It was going to be a bar fight. At the time, Mogadishu was easily the most intense fight that we had been in since the Vietnam War. I didn't know half of those Rangers. I didn't know one of them by name, but they were an American soldier. They had the same uniform I had, and we weren't going home without them. Every American has seen the shocking images from Somalia. The scope of suffering there is hard to imagine. Already, over a quarter million people have died in the Somali famine. In the months ahead, five times that number. One and a half million people could starve to death. Food convoys have been hijacked, aid workers assaulted, ships with food have been subject to artillery attacks that prevented them from docking. There is no government in Somalia. Law and order have broken down. Anarchy prevails. One image tells the story. Imagine 7,000 tons of food aid literally bursting out of a warehouse on a dock in Mogadishu while Somalis starve less than a kilometer away because relief workers cannot run the gauntlet of armed gangs roving the city. I have given the order to move a substantial American force into Somalia. As I speak, a marine amphibious ready group, which we maintain at sea, is offshore Mogadishu. These troops will be joined by elements of the 1st Marine Expeditionary Force based out of Camp Pendleton, California, and by the Army's 10th Mountain Division out of Fort Drum, New York. They are America's finest. They will perform this mission with courage and compassion, and they will succeed. More than five books, several documentary films, and even an Academy Award-winning movie have told the story about the battle in Mogadishu, what many refer to as Black Hawk Down. But none have properly told the story of Task Force 214 until now. Tonight, President Bush's special envoy was emphasizing this is a humanitarian mission and not a military mission. Nonetheless, tomorrow, Robert Oakley will be meeting with the various warlords of this country, and he'll be spelling out to them in great detail just how much firepower will be coming ashore on Wednesday. Operation Restore Hope just can't start soon enough. Within three months, U.S. and United Nations military forces had significantly reduced the violence in Somalia. For the most part, the famine had ended. The majority of U.S. troops came home, and the United Nations forces took charge of peacekeeping operations. However, on the very day U.S. forces departed, warlord Mohammed Faradid began attacking rival warlords and disrupting humanitarian relief efforts. Food had once again become a tool of political power. Food becomes a currency of itself. And you know, now you're sitting in a port city of Mogadishu where all the food is coming in, and somebody has to control that, right? And that's where you know, I like to use the example of the third tribe. You know, now you introduce this third tribe called the UN um, you know, into this environment where it now has the, the, the ability to do the food distribution. And that's where the real power is. That's where the influence is. And if you're, if you're a Habagadir, if you're Abgal, I mean, this isn't something that, that uh, you know, now that food is currency, this is not something that you're, you're going to allow to, to continue to exist. Looting at any cost uh, under any guise uh, becomes the only mean for survival. Uh, uh, risk itself becomes really nonsensical, and, uh, and life is cheap. I saw people in the harbor of Mogadishu being shot uh, because of a bag of rice in front of my eyes. On June 5th, Adid's forces killed 25 Pakistani soldiers and wounded 44. You say this uh, Somali operation has been a success. Does that mean that the United <laughs> States and UN forces have captured the Somali warlord, uh, General Mohammed Farah Adid? No, they have not been arrested. The purpose of the operation was to undermine the capacity of Adid to wreak military havoc in Mogadishu. He murdered 23 UN peacekeepers. And I would remind you that before the United States and the United Nations showed up, 
He was responsible for the deaths of countless Somalis from starvation, from disease, and from killing. The back, the military back of Idid has been broken. A warrant has been issued for his arrest. In late July, the 2nd Battalion of the 14th Infantry, 10th Mountain Division, arrived in Mogadishu to serve as a quick reaction force for military units from 21 nations serving under the UN flag. This UN force was now operating under the authority of UN Charter Chapter 7, Peace Enforcement, a far more aggressive military mission, one rarely used but necessary in a country where there is no government. In August and September, troops from the 10th Mountain Division were engaged in numerous firefights with the Deeds forces. Peace enforcement was just a euphemism for politicians and academics. For the soldiers in Mogadishu, urban combat was a far more accurate mission description. On August 22nd, Secretary of Defense Les Aspen ordered the deployment of Task Force Ranger to Somalia. Their mission? Capture Mohammed Farah Adi. Task Force Ranger was organized with an assault force of individuals from Delta Force. They're the ones that actually execute the actions on the objective. You've got a security force, which was a Ranger infantry company, which is designed to contain people inside the objective from leaving and prevent people from outside the objective of entering. And you have a support force out of Task Force 160 Special Operations Aviation Regiment, which can do a variety of things, either provide fire support, can evacuate dead and wounded, can bring in additional ammunition, medical supplies, food if you need to stay there a long period of time. So you have three elements that doctrinally execute raids. And these warriors are the best the United States has. I mean, they are the best. Really, really, real, real pros. I think they'd be the first to agree they were given a very, very, very difficult mission, if not, if not a mission impossible. We, 214, had a task force ranger liaison element with us in our headquarters. Was, uh, Major Craig Mixon was our LNO. We worked on both you know, the command post exercises. I participated in training uh, with the 10th Mountain uh, Battalion, also went out on operations with uh, 10th Mountain. So every time that they would go out on their operations, I would participate with them. And then when, when Task Force Ranger would conduct operations, I would basically stay in the command post and then keep 10th Mountain abreast of what, what they were doing, where they were at, uh, and whether they needed any help. QRFs, as they're called, typically are used when there are not sufficient forces in country to handle the mission. Our purpose uh, for being there was to respond to any requirement that uh, was deemed necessary by the, the UN mission. Uh, it included uh, securing roads or main supply routes. Uh, it included conducting um, raids to take down weapons caches or reduce the number of weapons uh, within the city. Um, and, and it included responding to uh, downed aircraft or uh, any other incident that involved any other UN force. We were not embedded with Task Force Ranger, so we weren't in on the planning of their missions. We were at least knowledgeable as to, uh, okay, they've got some intel, they're gonna go out on a mission. You know, we as a QRF did not have a specified mission to do something concrete just because they launched on a raid based on actionable intel. Uh, we noted it because we we knew we could get the call, but it, until we got the call, there wasn't really anything we could do. But on 3 October, we got the call. And what prompted the call was helicopter got shot down. We all heard it at the same time, just a radio call. And then as soon as, as, soon as we heard it, to the chopper down, I, I went running out and got the company alerted. Uh, and I mean, we could do it in probably about 10 minutes, be on the trucks, because we had everything ready. All you had to do was just throw in your gear. And some aircraft got shot down, and there was a need then for additional conventional forces to 
uh, come into the fight. And they called the 2nd Battalion, 14th Infantry, 10th Mountain Division. Well, when we moved to the airfield, we really didn't have a plan because the initial mission was come to the airfield in the event that the task force ranger needs you. Sometime between us receiving the call and arriving at the airfield, um, the truth changed. So the truth changed from come to the airfield in the event task force ranger needs you to get to the airfield as soon as you can because we need you. And Colonel David and I went into the op center and you know, we met with uh, General Garrison and believe we met with the, the set of folks who were there. We, we got a, a, a briefing on uh, what had occurred um, and we got quick instructions as to the route we we're going to take. When the Colonel came out of there, I could look in his eyes and the only thing I said to myself was, oh shit, this is not good. It was a clear cut mission and a very confusing environment. I mean, there was nothing particularly perplexing about moving to a crash site to recover survivors or dead. Um, the challenging things were we didn't know exactly, we couldn't plot the crash site exactly on our maps. And there were bad guys that were trying to prevent us from getting to that crash site. Okay, from the very beginning, because once a helicopter goes down, that becomes, in military terminology, a baited ambush. It's the bait. That's the bait. Because the bad guys know that we don't leave our dead and wounded behind. We go get them. So that becomes the bait. And they know we're coming and there's only a certain number of ways you can get there. So under the, under the circumstances, there was really not much discussion. Uh, we opted for taking a route that was the fastest way possible of getting to that crash site. Oh, by the way, by this time, a second helicopter had also been shot down. Task Force Ranger needed assistance. So Charlie Company assembled on the airstrip. Colonel talked to him and gave a quick scenario uh, brief on how we're going to thrust into this. As we boarded these light-skinned vehicles that we had with sandbags and plywood as a or protection, we started moving. Uh, Mike Whetstone was the uh, the company commander in lead. Uh, we hit. It was relatively, you know, uneventful till we hit the K4 circle. As we were approaching the K4 traffic circle, there were actually a couple of Task Force Ranger Humvees headed the opposite direction, and they'd been hit. And as we were about ready to clear the circle, they were headed south, and they entered into basically it was a kill zone, an ambush kill zone. Everything erupted right there at K4 traffic circle. And it was RPGs and, and nothing but tracers and the walls on both sides of the of violin and just coming apart. I remember the thought I had uh, at that moment in time was, um, I'm not going home. Um, this, is, this is where I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die right here in this firefight. So we kept going, and then the next place we got hit was right at National Street because they had completely blocked it off with crushed cars and uh, burning uh, tires. And then we kept going, still, because of that, well, you weren't going to stop there. So we kept going until we got to the milk factory, which was completely blocked off. And so there was no way out of that because um, it was just, it was like three cars deep, trucks, um, debris, everything all over it, plus it was completely covered by fire. So that is where I made the decision we had to turn around. A decision was made to pull back, okay, and reassemble. We needed a bigger boat, that uh, we did not have sufficient combat power uh, to push through the burning barricades and to push through to get to the, uh, to the southern crash site. Then we had to run right back through the gauntlet again which was just about the same thing. So we had one truck that just barely made it back, all its tires shot out, windows shot out, everything just trashed. 
But we waited for him, and that was right at dusk. And I think it was at that moment that kind of the, the, the whole gravitas of the situation hit me, that, um, that these guys were really in trouble, and we were going to have to get them out. It was nobody else. It was us. Um, and I actually had a flashback to a, uh, a talk that uh, during the infantry pre-command course, when you get selected for infantry battalion command or brigade command, you've got a number of pre-command courses you go to. And uh, so we're at Fort Benning, Georgia, and the assistant commandant of the infantry school retired, major, eventually retired as a two-star, um, was, it was a one-star at the time, was, was, uh, we were having breakfast, Carl Ernst was his name, and he, uh, during the breakfast, he, he was very candid about it, he said, you know, during your time in command, um, there's a good chance you'll deploy to combat somewhere, and, uh, and just remember, you know, you're expendable. Um, don't stay in the colors of your regiment. That you're expendable. The, the regimental colors live on after you. So, you know, we have this like near miss in the uh, in the ambush site. I have this realization that this pretty grave situation. And 14th Infantry Regiment has a very long and proud regimental lineage and um, I just kind of made my mind up that you know we're not going to stain the colors tonight you know we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna come through so that was about it and after that it was uh, it's not because I'm some John Wayne gung-ho guy it's not it at all I just literally got my mind focused on let's get this mission done and uh and we did. Reconsolidate and reorganize. So we, we had to get our wounded off first, and then we had to find out what we didn't have left, which was a lot of ammo, okay, and uh, we, didn't, we needed water, because those are the two things you burn fastest. I knew we needed armor. I mean, that was one of the things that I thought of the whole time. I don't care who we could get armor from, but we needed to get it to get back in there. In May 1993, senior U.S. military leaders requested the deployment of U.S. armored vehicles to protect U.S. forces. These vehicles would offer protection from machine gun fire and even rocket-propelled grenades. Secretary of Defense Les Aspen denied this request. It became apparent to me that we were going to have to devise a new plan with something a little bit different. I'm back at the airfield. I've got Charlie Company largely intact, but pretty tired, Alpha Company, fresh, um, and um, back in the Task Force Ranger Operations Center to get a new estimate of what's going on and um, huddle a little bit with General Guile and General Garrison and then back out with my boys to make a new plan and, oh, by the way, move to the Newport facility where we're going to link up with some couple of Malaysian mechanized infantry companies and uh, pick up a Pakistani tank platoon while we're at it. <laughs> the APCs are more survivable than what we had, which were two and a half ton trucks with sandbags on the floor inside and offered no overhead protection whatsoever, very limited protection on the sides against an enemy that's, you know, firing RPGs and able to get on roofs of buildings and shoot down. The plan we came up with was um, was to ask the Malaysians to remove their infantry soldiers from their vehicles so that we could use them. And they acquiesced to that. And it's really hard to describe is the complexity of what was going on because by definition, when you say quick reaction force, you're basically saying things have, things have gone to hell. So much happened over the next couple of hours. Um, it, w it was just a very fluid thing, both in terms of what was going on um, on the objective areas where we had two aircraft down, 
um, and then are trying to prepare and get everything move, moving in the direction to support operations. I refer to it in my journal about just the stress associated with the constant um, sort of gut-wrenching feelings that you're feeling, which is, we've got to do this now. Everything is in a hurry. And it's not about hurry um, for the sense of going fast. It was hurry because uh, we had a lot of American soldiers being shot at, guys who were seriously wounded, people who were killed. Um, and the immense pressure just associated with that, coupled with the fact that we moved down to the airfield, we sort of get a briefing that things were, were, were staging tanks and uh, armored personnel carriers for your company to go in that we had never even been in before. We didn't even know how to open the doors. So getting everybody figured out which vehicles they were gonna go in, we had to get to the, the, the port facility so we could go out because the route we were gonna take was through there. And then the coordination with the Pakistani, the two tanks that I had, the APC commanders, none of them spoke, we never, we didn't speak the same languages. Getting all the ammunition, getting all my guys into vehicles, letting the leaders know the plans uh, of what we were doing uh, with that constant nagging, we have to hurry, people need our help. When all were gathered around the front of the Humvee, you know, map was down. One of the things that was discussed was the most effective route to get into where the crash sites were, were to go through the Abgal area. Um, because if we could get into the Abgal area uh, and get up to National Street, we would get up there without, without taking fire. We would avoid what occurred at, at K4 Circle. And, um, and that plan was absolutely the right plan. It was absolutely the right call uh, because it preserved the force prior to getting us into the fight. We did our radio checks and we did our, you know, weapons checks and we mounted up on, we were told you're gonna to mount up on these vehicles and we got on these things we'd never seen before. We spent quite some time with uh, trying to figure out, remember, how to open the doors and how to close the door. We had never seen these vehicles, they were big white vehicles with UN painted on the side of them kind of deal and I'm just like, all right, we're going into a gunfight with a white vehicle, good. It was a big white, solid piece of metal um, and we're like we're gonna be like a sitting target in this thing you know it's, it's dark and uh, this thing's like glowing white. We got in these things and uh, the, we couldn't speak to the drivers and they to the crew and they couldn't speak to us. There was a significant level of um, concern I think on all parties because uh, there were Americans um, not only in contact, contact but there were Americans that were dying um, in combat and so there was a, 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 a real sense of urgency that we had to get everything moving. The challenge was that we're only gonna get one more shot. And, and if we don't do it right now, we may not get another shot. It was a moment for me that all the training that we went through, this was our destiny. And as I troop the line and I looked just about every soldier in the eye as I would walk by him. If eyes could talk, your eyes to me would say, we're prepared, Sergeant Major. And mine back to them would have said, I know you are. There's a thing that General Garrison talked about being deliberate valor and the willingness to go into the fight come back out of it, and then go back into the fight. So all of these units, 10th Mountain did that, Task Force Rain, the elements of Task Force Ranger did that. You're combining them, then you combine the Malaysians, then you combine the Pakistanis, and then you throw them into the streets of Mogadishu. That is as complex as it's gonna get. It was a matter of meeting Major Aziz at the time who was gonna take us the, he's the Malaysian commander was going to take us into the fight. Major Aziz is actually a wonder to work with in the end. I couldn't have been blessed with a, with a better man uh, to get me through the night. So there was about 99 or so uh, rangers from Task Force Rangers that were on the ground. Uh, that included both Delta operators and, and rangers. Uh, and we had uh, Task Force 160th was flying in support, put them in, and they're also flying uh, various types of aircraft to give them uh, air cover and support. Uh, and then, uh, roughly speaking, about 340, 350 or so members of the 214 
along with some uh, rangers. There's about, uh, I think, a dozen or more, maybe 15, 16 rangers. Uh, some Delta operators, probably about six or eight Delta operators, uh, all part of Task Force 214. Thankfully, um, you know, we, we did have, uh, I think, as a part of that plan, the, the, the pieces for success, meaning, you know, we had the Task Force Ranger LNO, and that's LNO, I guess, team that allowed or facilitated the communication which prevented the fratricide that, that could have occurred. Um, that was an extremely critical piece. Uh, you also had, in my estimation, a well-trained uh, battalion task force that had already been hardened by battle, understood what needed to be done, um, and, and was capable of, of executing uh, once it understood what the requirement was. And so I believe the combination of those two things uh, in addition to some tremendous leadership at every level. Because the plan was that the, that the Pakistani tanks would lead. Well, right before we were ready to pull out of the Newport area, there was a captain in charge of the Pakistani tank platoon. He had received orders from his brigade commander that he was not allowed to lead. So we had to deviate the plan a little bit and put move the Pakistani tanks a little bit further back in the column so these Malaysian condors could, could lead and go. When I finally came back, it looked like the plan was created and what we're gonna do, how we're gonna break on through, which is no longer to assist the Rangers, but rescue the Rangers. Sir, we're ready to march. It just seemed like the timing was all wrong and nothing was gonna be in our favor. You know, granted, we, we own the night, but we didn't really own the streets of Mogadishu. And, you know, even going in with a force like that, it just seemed like, you know, this was going to be a different game. It was going to be a bar fight. As we turn down the National Street, you know, the, the whole world changes. Everyone, the entire um, you know, Black Sierra, Bacara market area has come to the party and they've all brought, brought weapons with them. And, you know, from my perspective, riding in an open Humvee, uh, which, you know, for those who have not had the experience of riding in an open Humvee in combat, is, is much like riding in a, um, a convertible Corvette, um, you know, down, down Main Street during a parade, uh, and everyone in the parade is shooting at you. As soon as we turned and went down National Street, uh, you know, the bullets just erupted. It was the first, you know, we could really see the tracers flying back and forth across the street. You know, it was a veritable car wash of bullets. And it was at that moment that I realized, you know, my mortality and I might not be coming out of this. The bullets started to tink. It was one, two, a few tinks, and we started to get our interest started to perk up a little, and then as we got into town, that whole, I could remember the gunner closing the hatch and pull, coming inside. Now we were getting hit from bullets from every which way, small arms fire. You could hear the rounds hitting the vehicles. You could hear RPGs hitting the vehicles. Uh, one hit ours. You know, shaking back and forth from um, RPGs exploding off it or near and around it. And it, it was totally another world. I mean, the RPGs nearby, the flashes in the small windows, we're all pressing our heads up as far as we can on these, on the condors, trying to look out the windows to see what the hell's going on. A little bulletproof glass. And getting, you know, the APCs t surging and taking off and then almost stopping and running over curbs or whatever, because we're just getting tossed around in the back. We're getting bounced from one side to the other side and the explosions and everything else are going off outside the vehicle. It was sometime during this when, when the lead two vehicles um, got hit by RPG, an RPG and went off course and missed the turn that we were supposed to make. The route that they're supposed to go is blocked and they're not going to be driving over and through that. The route directly in front of them continuing to the west on National Street is blocked. The southern route, which turns also goes back to the Newport facility, is open. So they took the path of least resistance, turned south, and gunned it to get out of the kill zone, get out of the ambush that they were currently in. 
And it was just miraculous that Drew Meyerwich was able to prevent the rest of the column from following them. I'm sitting there holding the handle of a door and hearing the rounds pinging on the other side, knowing that sometime in the very near future, somebody's going to tell me to get out. When it got hit, I mean, you knew immediately something, something's not right. It was very loud in the first place, and then you could just hear all the, the engine and, and all the electronics shutting down. And then the lead vehicle gets hit, and I had Sergeant Hollis call back to me, and he's, you know, because we stopped. And he says, my vehicle's been hit, and I said to him, well, get out, and establish security around the vehicle. And that's when our vehicle got hit. We got, you know, just came to an abrupt stop, you know, we got hit by an RPG that hit right below where the driver sits. And he, uh, he ended up flying back and landed on a couple of soldiers. And I, I looked over at Lieutenant Hollis and Lieutenant Hollis said, get out. I was like, damn, it's here. I just wanted out of this big white vehicle. And I opened the door and I kept thinking, all right, everybody is behind me. This is going to be fine. This is going to be okay. Because I've got two rifle companies, Delta Element with us and all this other kind of stuff. I was like, cool, we got all kinds of folks. We're just going to get into another fight. And I opened the door and I paused for a moment at the door and I looked back the direction of travel. And, uh, and that's when the, the, the realization hit me. And I was like, there's no one there. Half of one of my platoons is off course and not with us. Um, and Colonel David sort of took control of that situation and said, hey, you got to continue the mission. The Malaysians were unwilling to basically drive through the obstacles. So Alpha Company had to dismount. And we knew we were going to have to dismount at some point. But Alpha Company had to dismount a little bit earlier than we thought. So when we got to the Olympic Hotel area, the, that street was blocked by a couple of bodies of vehicles um, and a whole bunch of burning tires. Um, the simple thing would have been for the tank to run right through it, um, but the Pakistani tanks weren't going to do that. An American tank would have, an M1 would have done that without, a, without, a, without a, even a thought in his mind. Um, but they refused to go. And it was at that point in time, remember, I had two tanks in front of my vehicle, and then there's my dismount, me and my Humvee. Um, the tanks, as we hit that intersection, um, literally backed up and, and left my, me and this Humvee sort of sitting right smack in that intersection and looking at this obstacle. And I knew at that point in time, the only way we were going to get through that was to physically move it and go ourselves. Um, I knew we were, no, we were only a couple of blocks from Task Force Ranger, so it wasn't like we were going to have to go miles down the road. We were, we were close. Um, and that was the point in time where I started going into each of the vehicles one by one and sort of saying, dismount and moving people forward. Captain Myrich, he knocked on our door a couple times, yelled, get out. There was a few more words than that. I opened the door, got one leg out, and get back in. So I Sucked my leg back in as fast as could and shut the door. And uh, we rolled a few more feet, and I hear get out again. And then when we got out, uh, it was on. It's like a cartoon. It's like a Bugs Bunny or, you can't explain it. It, it like the bullets outlines your body. And the, the concrete that's being chipped off them from them bullets hitting stings. And you just get up against the wall and it's, it's weird at first. He's just stepping out, and there's burning vehicles and rubble everywhere. Um, you can hear the uh, little birds above us zipping around, you know, um, doing their doing their runs. And when the convoy came to a halt, when uh, an Alpha Company went to the first crash site, and, and Charlie Company began to move to the second crash site, uh, I saw uh, Lee Van Arsdale. Um, you know, you know, dismount the vehicle, and then begin to move down the middle of the street, and um, you know, it's truly as if he was walking uh, in the park, not as if he was walking amongst uh, rounds. You know, traces flying everywhere, and it was, 
it, it was a, a little surreal, um, you know, kind of like you're watching, I think some have said, a Mad Max movie where all of this stuff is going on all around him. And he's simply moving as if nothing is happening because he's a man with a he's a man with a purpose. Understanding that you know he's got to he's got to help uh, you know develop the situation or sort it out. Um, and while he's doing that, um, I think unaware to him, but it's a example of personal leadership. It's the what we've always taught about leading from the front, right? Uh, it's leaders leaders do they don't just talk. Uh, it's you know guys who walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Well, here was a guy who um, was clearly uh, an experienced combat veteran who was, you know, leading from the front. And I could say personally, it was inspiring to me. But I would also say that that it was inspiring to others who had the ability to see that level of calmness uh, amid all of that chaos. And when you looked in the street, there was debris everywhere. There were pieces of wall, tires, pieces of vehicle just blocking the road. And. Uh, the company commander says, uh, we are going to have to move that stuff because these vehicles are not going to make it. As Sergeant Roberts, who is now the platoon leader for 2nd Platoon because Mark Hollis is somewhere else, I have to inform him, number one, that his platoon leader and his lead squad have been are ambushed and off course. So you're in charge. And number two, your platoon is, this is all you got left of your platoon. Um, I brought him over and we emplaced a machine gun uh, to support uh, the breaching of the obstacle that he was going to conduct with his guys um, and he was given that mission to uh, secure, open the obstacle up uh, and secure uh, the foothold of it so that Curtis Crumb, Sergeant Warner, his platoon sergeant and first platoon could assault through it and get go, be the link up platoon for Task Force Ranger. Platoon sergeant got out of his vehicle by this time everybody is dismounting um, and we set up the machine guns as Overwatch. And then my squad and a bunch of other guys we ran out in the road and we started rolling all this debris out of it. And I mean, I'm watching the sparks as bullets are striking the road between my legs. I was amazed, I was totally amazed that nobody got here. We moved up the road and we would cover each corner, cover each other as we moved until we got to, I think it was the block before the hotel. And uh, we came on a heavy fire. That road towards the Olympic Hotel, I, I think Second Platoon was in the lead. Uh, I could see what was going. I could see the Olympic Hotel. Guys were firing out of every window, and they kept running from room to room. They were bouncing all over. I mean, we got into quite a sustained firefight right there. Uh, my guys in the alley, and the gun team, and uh, the third squad, pasted against the side of the building. We're trying to suppress the Olympic Hotel because all the windows were winking at us. And when we got out, I was leading on my side of the road and on the other side was PFC Martin. And uh, it wasn't long after we got out that Martin was killed. They couldn't, couldn't tell who it was from where, from where I was at, but as, I, as we moved up and got closer later, I could see the M60 laying there and I saw a real big body laying there and, and I thought it was Cooper because I knew it was second platoon and, and him and I were we were real close and then that's when I, I was not scared over there not one second until I saw the first person I knew dead. To uh, eventually hear you know when your buddies um, get put down. I remember grabbing Martin and pulling him back behind the APC for cover. And another medic came up, um, Sean Atkins came up, and as I was bent over checking on Martin, I remember this guy cursing and yelling, and I look up, and he's been shot right through the shoulder muscle. And I tossed a bandage to the guy beside him, and I said, do buddy aid, because all my soldiers knew how to do basic first aid to apply a dressing. Me and Sean moved Martin, when uh, after Major Marino had come up and told us to stop working on him. And we kind of ignored Major Marino and Major Marino pushed us off Martin. And that's when it kind of realized that we'd lost him. It, it was a, a shocker to me, an eye opener to me. Uh, I silently said the uh, Lord's Prayer. But I tell you, the soldiers didn't lose focus because of the NCOs that were kicking ass. 
they wouldn't let them dwell on it. Okay? And because of that, our momentum was still forward. There was no hesitation. No hesitation. Uh, so it, it, uh, knowing that, the loss is heavy. Always is. But with the NCOs keeping the soldiers focused, that mission there became successful. I've been focusing too much on what was going on behind me. Um, I know they trying to get him pulled back to uh, behind one of his APCs so they can uh, work on him. Um, I think uh, my, my mission was to try to alleviate the threat that was in front of us and uh, so we can keep moving forward to the, uh, to the Rangers. So much happens over the next minutes, and, and I say minutes because it could have been hours, and, and it would have felt the same to me because I, it wasn't, it was very quickly done. We did not spend a lot of time in that area, but um, no, we weren't there for, I mean, as we even began to do the initial assault onto it, uh, it was at that point in time that Specialist Boynton, the machine gun that I had placed with Sergeant Roberts on, uh, to support the fire, uh, Specialist Boynton was the, the gunner and Private Martin was the assistant gunner. Um, it was right as we were initiating this, this assault um, that Boynton and Martin both got shot. Martin was killed uh, almost instantly in that. And uh, Boynton, so um, that was right by where we were. I mean, it was exactly, it wasn't like it was far away. Um, so now I have a machine gun team that's down. We're still trying to breach. His second machine gun team comes forward to support, start supporting things. Uh, thing, but it's a very fluid thing. So I've got casualties over here. I've got a breach going on here. I'm preparing to assault across the objective at the same exact time. Um, and of course, my company medic is over worried about the, the casualties. And I've got the platoon leader who's trying to get his guys through the force. I got another platoon who's getting his guys all riled up, ready to go through an assault to get the task force ranger. He's showing them where they're at on the map. Remember, they were inside of a vehicle all night out for for an hour or so and they don't see anything all they see is that all they hear is the, the bullets shooting off the pinging off the sides of the vehicle they have no idea where they are so just me, me showing him where he's at and then him being able to show his guys okay guys we are at the olympic hotel this is one of the things things we talked about here's where we are right now this is where we suspect rain task force ranger is they're only two blocks away uh, he's trying to figure out the link-up procedures. This is all going on in a matter of seconds. Um, it, but again, remember I've been telling you about that constant source of, okay, we got to get there. we got to hurry. These guys need us. Things had not gotten better for Task Force Ranger in this period of time. It's not like things were calming down. We were taking fire from every, I mean, I could, almost any window and every window, there, there was someone shooting out, shooting at us. And we, after that happened, we said, it took a, a while. They pulled up, they pulled up some Humvees with some Mark 19s and they started knocking down that Olympic Hotel. They had a lot of people in there. I mean, they, we were at a, they had us pinned, pinned in there pretty good. We're taking fire from every rooftop, window, doorway, alleyway, street intersection. Captain Meyerwich came and told me that the lead armored personnel carrier refused to move, and I later reading the after action report saw that he had been ordered by his command not to go forward for whatever reason. But that was unacceptable, so I told Matt Ryerson, go, go make that vehicle go forward and I'll keep the easy job for myself. And I went to the front of the infantry column and said, let's go. We knew the Rangers were out there, we didn't know where. So you're, you're clearing buildings and clearing areas and houses very carefully. Very fortunate we didn't, we didn't have any friendly kills and some houses were, you know, passive and some houses weren't. The Little Birds were lifesavers. Uh, that's the only thing that was gonna keep us alive that night. First platoon, I think it was, moved through our guys and they picked up the lead and we ended up as the tail platoon. Um, and uh, they stayed up front. We stayed, we remained trail until we actually linked up with the Rangers. We had to go a little bit north of the Olympic Hotel, took a right turn to the east, and then uh, back north uh, three or four more blocks. 
and then the crash site was in an alley off of that street. I stopped us about a block and a half short of where the task force ranger element was. I was in radio contact with Scotty Miller, the ground force commander. I stopped us short because my prime consideration at this point in time is no fratricide. So Scotty and I were coordinating. I went forward with my radio operator, kept the, kept the company and the APCs back, went forward and physically linked up with Scotty Miller, found out where he had his people, then went back to where the company was, came back to link up with Captain Meyer, which Captain Steele was there, and they were arguing about who was in charge. I was in kind of an awkward position because I'm not in the 10th Mountain chain of command. In fact, I was in nobody's chain of command. I was the officer in charge of the Joint Operations Center. But American soldiers, I don't care who they are, they respond well to positive leadership. And I said, all right, guys, I'm in charge. And they both said, yes, sir. So when we finally got to the objective area, um, it was enough, there was enough uh, f uh, flexibility for all of our vehicles to start pulling in. The problem was all of them could not fit in this, this small street. I mean, you bring, a, you bring a vehicle, you can bring two or three vehicles in and then you're packed. And now you're in a traffic jam in the middle of this. It was just that small of a, of a terrain. So you have to bring them in and load up some casualties and then move it to another location so it could be secured and that was out of the way so we could get more, more vehicles in. And while all this is going on, everybody's under fire. One of my Mark 19s um, is disabled. It gets hit by an RPG. Alpha Company was having a very, very tough time getting... Um, extracting pilot and co-pilot out of the Black Hawk helicopter, given the, the attitude that it landed at, which was upside down, and the armor, and the fact that they were in contact, and it was a very difficult situation. If anything could go wrong, it was going wrong at that particular moment in time. The saw uh, was not able to cut through the frame of the console that was sort of the piece that we needed to move, um, and ingenuity became the, the buzzword. We started taking tow cables, and we started run, ramming it with vehicles, just trying to to sort of flip it up on its side so that we could get to Chief, Chief Wilcox and his, his body and get him home. We're sitting there and um, we're just getting pounded. I mean, ordnance is falling out of the sky. Uh, RPGs, I mean, we had uh, some of the Malaysian APCs inside of our perimeter and those were RPG magnets, and they would get hit, and shrapnel would go flying everywhere. And I think we got a couple of people wounded there. I didn't know this, this was possible, but I saw a light coming at us. And this thing bounced off the road, hit the wall, and landed right next to us. It was an RPG round. <laughs> hit the wall, it bounced off the road, hit the wall broadside, and fell over. And didn't go out, didn't go off. Crazy. We never looked at a watch or looked at the moon to see what time of the night it was or anything like that. But, uh, you know, it, it took a long time. And you'd say, boy, when is this going to end? I remember, thinking, I remember thinking that to myself. When is this, you know, how much longer this ends? In my own mind, I questioned why it was taking so long. Why were, why were we there so long? Because we had mortar rounds that literally walked down the street. One hit in front of the vehicle, one hit behind the vehicle. And in my mind, I thought... You know, lots of folks are going to continue to die if, if we don't get out of here right now. And, and in my own mind, I thought or I felt like there were many others out there, not just me, who had the same feeling, both, you know, on the ground and, and back in the jock. And, uh, and then when Colonel David, I mean, he got on uh, the battalion command that, and he said, look, we're going to stay here as long as it takes to get everybody out of here. And uh, for me... You know, that was, um, it was a moment where it was almost as if all the anxiety was lifted. I mean, it was, okay, we're, we're, we're going to be here until, you know, until it gets done. We had two APCs that pulled down the road a little bit in front of it and one that pulled beside it, and the rest of them started stacking up behind, getting defensive positions. Um, they were rpg to the two in front were rpg immediately from the three-story building that were that was right to our front uh, and a just firefight started right then and there where we stopped so our fire pushed it back uh, until we got everybody dismounted uh, and then we started pushing the perimeter out a bit uh, protecting the vehicles because that was our way out in the end it was about 
250 meters. It wasn't it wasn't a long distance, but in the middle of the night in a rammed shackled tin labyrinth, it was a long way to go. At every corner, you didn't know what was going to happen because there was no semblance of order, and it was kind of kind of horror movie ish. The helicopter itself was like Swiss cheese; it had been shot so many times. And we got all the sensitive items out of it, and we hollered all the guys' names there, followed blood trails. And moving through from shanty to shanty, because it's an enormous shanty complex here, we'd yell into the shacks or be yelling across the way there their names, looking hopefully they'd, they'd answer, that they'd be holed up in an area, still pulling security and hiding or something, and we'd be able to, to discover them. And, give them assistance. Probably a good 20 minutes where we followed what we could uh, and shouted their names in every direction, up every alleyway, nothing. So it was pretty disconcerting, hollow. It's the only way I can describe it. When we got out and I got to the wall, that first split second thought is where the hell is everybody else at? As soon as we piled out, we just got alongside that wall and just was like, you know, we're not getting out of here. And you know, my wife was pregnant with our first child and I didn't think I was gonna be coming home to see that, either one of them. I didn't want to accept that we were by ourselves. I said, I'm going to move back and I'm going to link up with, with the battalion. We're going, to, we're going to find out where they are because they can't be far. And uh, I took uh, uh, the engineers, machine gun team, and, and my interpreter with us and kind of deal. And I started working our way back up the hill to see if I could, you know, where are they? I need to, to get in touch with these folks. Uh, you know, there's no way that we're just two vehicles uh, out here by ourselves. That just wouldn't happen. Um, sure enough, we were. I heard Dragon 6 tell Terminator 6 the second, second platoon was missing and presumed dead, and that we needed Charlie Mike to continue the mission. I'm like, dead? Hell, I ain't dead. I yelled across the street to Lieutenant Hollis. I was like, Lieutenant Hollis, Lieutenant Hollis, did you hear that? He said, what? I said, we're missing and presumed dead, sir. So I was yelling back to him, you know, hey, <laughs> hey, if you've got communication, because I'm still trying to use the ComSec on the radio, which wasn't working. The 126 doesn't have ComSec. I said, if you've got communications with them, tell them we're not dead. And then I just grabbed the radio from Keller, and I pulled off the KO-8 and the Vincents and everything else, and I just shoved that stuff back inside the rucksack, and I went completely in the clear. And I said, uh, Terminator, or excuse me, uh, Dragon 6, Terminator 2-6, and I got Colonel David, which was a great relief for a young second lieutenant. One, you finally got communication with someone. But two, but Colonel David is like the calmest person on the radio that I know. And I probably wasn't the calmest person on the radio. And uh, I, I just said, hey, uh, Dragon 6, Terminator 2-6, uh, we have a big shit sandwich down here, and we're taking a huge bite. And I remember what he said. He said, you know, hey, son. You're alive, keep doing what you're doing, we'll get you some help. We did everything at the crash site and, and started to make our way back. Uh, during that time, we did a 3-2-1 countdown kind of thing and shot our clusters. I shot mine, he had a parachute flare, and uh, I shot mine up and it was way further than any 100 meters. So, I mean, I figured 700 if not a kilometer south of us. When we get back, I had a leaders meeting and told them what was going on because they all thought we were getting ready to go. Uh, and that wasn't the case. And it was going to be a while uh, until we got it done because we weren't leaving them down there. A good half hour after we had gotten there, um, we heard uh, an RPG go off and then Cooper you know, started you know, hollering, screaming and saying he got hit 
and again, being a combat lifesaver, you know, I went with uh, one or two security across the street and looked at him and he had, luckily had the flak vest on because, you know, the shrapnel um, was in the, in the middle of his back in the flak vest and he said, uh, you know, got burned pretty, pretty good with, uh, from the um, shrapnel. But like I said, that's what the flak vests are for, to stop shrapnel and, and that kind of stuff. So he was very fortunate to have that on. This guy with an AK takes it and he just, he just goes out the, at the door, the alley or whatever, it was a doorway, and he just sprays like this. And Lee, Maxwell, and Houston were hit right in front of me. And I've got a door stoop that's, or a piece of, piece of concrete in front of me. And I'm like now the lead guy. And I'm pulling uh, Houston back. And I knew Houston was, was wounded badly. So just about everybody in their unit was wounded by that time. I told him to hunker down and we would work this out. Um, one way or the other. We were getting light on ammo. And uh, my best friends in the world came through. Those pilots from the aviation were dead. And if it hadn't been for those guys, we'd probably be dead today. And that's when I went to Major Aziz and asked if we could borrow his vehicles, one way or the other. Either us drive them or him drive them, and we go down and get them. It didn't happen the first time. He called his battalion commander, and the answer was no. Uh, went back, talked to my guys. We started doing the dismounted plan in case we couldn't get the vehicles. Went back to him the second time, the answer was still no. He started getting mad, I started getting mad because the battalion commander just did not understand our situation. Uh, he wasn't leaving his guys down there, I wasn't leaving my guys down there. So um, Major Aziz made one of the bravest choices that I thought, I mean, for a career. He decided to not follow his battalion commander's orders got his vehicles, has got his third platoon leader to head on down. We just piled in uh, to these vehicles. We were packed in there pretty tight, and then we moved to the stadium. We'd been fighting all night, you know. I don't, I'm not sure how many, how much ammo I had left, how much water I had left. So there was just an eerie feeling of knowing that, you know, our supplies were running out and it was daylight. and. Our advantage was gone, you know. It was time to get out of there, so it was, it was a little nerve-wracking. And it started to get light, and we started looking at each other going, we need to get out of here. This is not good now. So now we were going to try to get out in daylight. And, uh, <laughs> it was, it was nervous-making. Before I authorized Drew to withdraw off of the northern crash site, we, had, we actually had confirmation from the Task Force Ranger Operations Center that everybody was accounted for. Um, that's, not an ins that's not a scene that has gotten portrayed very accurately as in Hollywood and other places. Once we got the bodies extracted from the helicopter, I figured the best way to get back was to put the QRF up front. They were the freshest troops. They'd been there the least amount of time. It made sense for them to lead. And it was a good company commander, a good first sergeant, good chain of command. They were rock solid. I put the Delta element in the middle. They're the most experienced. If they need to react anywhere, that's the place for them to be. And then put the Rangers in the rear. They're, they've been out there for 17, 18 hours. They're exhausted, they're dehydrated, but they're still Rangers. So I felt very comfortable with them having my back. So now we had our convoy going back. And that's where the term Mogadishu Mile came from. It was about 800 meters from where we dismounted at the rally point to the crash site, 800 meters back, 1600 meters. Mogadishu Mile sounds a lot better than the Mogadishu 1600 meter. This was not something that just happened on their part because as we, were, as we moved from block to block, you would find RPG rounds stacked at the corner. So this was, I mean, they, they had this plan or maybe they planned it real fast when the hel once the helicopter came in, but uh, they were waiting for us and they knew we were gonna come and they were prepared to fight. So we, we headed out on foot the same, the same way we came in. 
right back past that Olympic Hotel. Way more, I fired way more on that in that morning. I, only, I think I only shot one mag on the way in 30 times and I shot four on the way out. So the fire that morning was way, it was way more intense for me than it was that night from, from getting targets to shoot at. There was people everywhere popping out of every alley, out of every door. And it was, it was just this fire, I mean, it was a, a firefight of RPGs and small arms fire. Um, one of my company RTOs was wounded at that point in time. We went through the, went through the APCs, turned to the right, and that's when a grenade went off behind me and I got fragged from that and got shot and it took me down. I know there were a couple of operators that were out there running with me. Um, and I know uh, I ran for quite some time. Uh, I really wish I was in an APC still at that point in time. All the APCs were parked quite a ways down there. I can remember two lane road each way with a big divider in the middle. And we ran, we, we got down there. I think we were first again. We, were, we came upon them and our whole squad piled into one. The running was more about making sure you had p policed up everybody along the way. I, it wasn't like I was gonna run straight down the middle of the road like I was running a marathon. Uh, it was nothing like that. It was, it was sort of like trying to make sure I, we had all the pieces. And uh, I could just remember everybody looking at each other once that door shut and we just like, did that really just happen? It was a, 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 that feeling of being back in there looking at each other and guys seeing each other and hugging and stuff like, I just can't believe what we, what we just went through. And to see that, you know, we're back and we're, we're still alive was, was, was crazy. My executive officer was back there as well. He, in fact, I think Chuck ended up on top of my vehicle as well. I mean, we just, it was sort of a zoo just trying to make sure we had everybody. I had good control of my company. Didn't mean I had control of my individuals. Uh, my platoon leaders had good controls of their platoons, but that's not their whole platoon. They're, they're, that's a platoon. I trusted my platoon leaders had all of their soldiers. My platoon leaders trusted my squad leaders to have all eight of their men. My squad leaders trusted my team leaders to have all four of their men. So what happened, why some people thought they were left behind, I'm sure, is that as the foot element stretched out in the accordion effect, the vehicular element compressed forward in the, in the reverse accordion effect. And once those guys in the very back saw those vehicles around the corner and didn't see them again, they were convinced they got left behind. It simply didn't happen. And 214 successfully uh, extracted the Rangers along with the Delta operators and others. People lost their lives, but you really never knew how big it was until you got to the stadium and seeing the triage, um, seeing the Rangers and everybody laid out with, in body bags. Shock that you just can't imagine. This is tough. <clears throat> when we got to the Pakistani compound and I got out of the APC, the way we were parked, when I got out, I'm looking across all the cots with the dead bodies. And I remember walking up and I saw Wonkowski and I was like, where's everybody else? And that's when he told me they, they all got shot. People laying everywhere in the field. I mean, it, don't ever want to go back. You recite the words, you say the words, and I think, I don't know that you ever believe that you're ever gonna be in a position where you have to live the words. And then you do, and, and it changes you. 
you know, they're, they're not just words anymore. Um, they're just not words anymore. I'm enormously proud of uh, 10th Mountain, but also the Rangers and the Delta operators uh, and all the, the U.S. forces, Marines, the aviators from 160th, uh, all of the U.S. military forces that served in Mogadishu, served in harm's way at that time, uh, I'm just enormously proud of their personal courage, uh, their personal bravery. Uh, and I had many, many friends in 214. Uh, Mike Ellaby was wounded in action. Bill David was one of the most extraordinary battalion commanders I've ever met. Uh, and I will tell you that uh, those Delta operators that were on the scene at the time, Scotty Miller, who's now the commander, four-star commander in Afghanistan, he was wounded in Mogadishu as a Delta operator at the time, uh, and many, many others. Uh, I've known them off and on throughout the years, I've served with them. Uh, these are extraordinary soldiers, and I'm enormously proud to have walked along their side and, and, uh, and proud of their courage and their bravery. I'll just say on a, on a personal level, um, I was extremely proud of the battalion then, and I'm just as proud of them today as I was then. Um, maybe even a little bit prouder. I mean, for the most part, these were fought by young men between the ages of 18 and 22. And now it's sometimes young men and young women between the ages of 18 and 22. I mean, that's, that's the bulk. First term enlistees, right out of high school. I credit the live fire exercises for giving them a lot of that sense. Um, and the platoon leaders were, were just absolutely superb. I mean, leading from the front and displaying the physical and moral courage that, you know, absolutely essential in those positions. NCOs were great doing exactly what they had to do. I mean, it was really the NCOs. Command Sergeant Major Counts and the Company First Sergeants and the Platoon Sergeants. You know, looking at it in hindsight, you know, I don't, I don't ever have a second thought that um, there was something we should have done that we didn't do, or something we could have done differently, faster, or whatever. I, I don't have any of those second thoughts. So. Um, I think we did the regimental colors proud that night.